So this is your home. This is your home away from Chicago, Sam. Good to have you back, my, my brother. It's all, it's all good. I should say bless you. Yeah, yeah. God bless you. We actually planned that out. Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications. Because he inclines his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The cords of death encompassed me. The terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low when you saved me. Return to your rest. O oh, my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. When was the last time you called upon the name of the Lord? My name is Sam Macho. I played nine years in the NFL, four with the Cardinals, four with the Bears, one year with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I got there right before Tom Brady in their Super Bowls. So I'm still mad about that. Um, they told me they would sign me back. Bruce Arians was the coach. He was like, hey, I got you, and he never called me, so I'm still mad um, at him and all the other people with the organization. Um, I finished my career at the, at the NFL. I started joining ESPN, so now I'm an ESPN college football and NFL analyst. I've been doing that for the last two years. I started a nonprofit called Athletes for Justice, really in the wake of 2020 COVID and the George Floyd murder, kind of me and athletes figure what, actually it was before that, what can we do to try and make change in our community? Um, I'm married, I have uh, four kids, an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a six-month-old, so I miss them very much. Um, but as I've been thinking about not only this message, but you all, I've been thinking about, man, like, we forget the truth of Scripture. Like, I didn't realize that God inclines his ear to me. That's what the psalmist says. I love the Lord because he hears my voice. God hears my voice. God hears your voice. God hears your supplications, your requests, your asks. And because of that, that truth, there should be a response. Therefore, I call upon him. As long as I live. I mentioned I, I uh, live in Chicago. You're from Pastor Palmer. I live in Chicago. And uh, the last couple years, I've been doing a lot of work on the south side and west sides of Chicago. Those familiar with Chicago, you'll know um, the west side and the south sides are uh, predominantly black and brown neighborhoods. And really, society in a lot of ways has neglected those neighborhoods. And so just a few days ago, I was at this event where with, um, you know, the mayor was there and the mayor of Chicago came and some pro athletes came and some community members, the lieutenant governor and all these people came because we were opening up this facility, this, this 10 acre campus, sports complex, food, after school programs, all this stuff on the west side of Chicago. It was like one of the coolest things I've got a chance to be a part of. It's the largest indoor, uh, full size FIFA regulated soccer field in the region, and we helped build it on the west side. And as I was there, I was kind of emceeing the event, and I got a chance to hear from the mayor, and she spoke. 
And I heard from some pro athletes, Jason Hayward, right, for the, he, the Dodgers now with the Cubs. Bless you. This is going to be part of our thing. Um, <laughs> and he spoke. Lieutenant governors, all these people spoke. And I was sitting there kind of emceeing, but taking notes, listening. But it wasn't what I heard from the mayor, from the athletes, from these governors. It was what I heard from a, a, a former athlete, a, a former soccer player who started this nonprofit called Intentional Sports that's helping run all the programming there. So he's speaking, right? After all these people speak, he's, spe he's speaking. And he says, um, and some of y'all may have heard this phrase before. Um, he says, you are a product of the five people in whom which you spend the most time with. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like the five people you spend the most time with, y'all kind of not in it, like you're a product of them. Y'all heard that before? Yes, no? Right? So I'm sitting there like, okay, great. Like this is my thing. I'm going to get it. I'm going to hang out with the mayor now, right? I'm going to be friends with the mayor or be friends with like these pro athletes. I'm going to go call like, you know, Fitz, like Larry Fitzgerald. Hey, can we be friends? I want to hang up. Like I want to up my game. Um, and he's speaking and he says, you're a product of the five people you spend the most time with. And he stops and he says, I want my five to stand up. And he points at his, at his wife and his four kids and they stand. And I was blown away from that because I'm, you know, an achiever and want to go and get and move all the things. He's like, no, nah, man, my family, these are my people. And so we finished that whole event and we're kind of hanging and mixing and mingling. And I go up to him. His name is Andy McDermott. I say, Andy, why was it that you, out of all the people you could have chosen, you picked your, your wife and your kid? Like, I, I, I love family, but why? And he looked at me and he said, Sam, I thought about it this way. I said, at my funeral... Who's going to be carrying my casket? That's the way I approach these decisions. He said that, and it brought me back to a point about a year ago from today, 13 months ago, when I was carrying a casket. My grandmother had just passed away. She was the matriarch of our family, born and raised in Nigeria in this small village, like her, she lived not in a house, in a hut, right? There was one little like light bulb. If you wanted to go to the, to the restroom, it's like, hey, just point out back, like in the bush. Like that was, that was a thing. That's how she grew up. And she kind of raised her family, committed them to the Lord, right? My dad, born and raised in Nigeria, mom, and when I say like in the village, I'm talking about like, um, like no light, no running water, to get water to drink, they would go to the stream, right? Get a big old bucket, bring the bucket, fill it up, walk miles with that bucket, go and boil the water, because it's dirty water. Boil it so the, the, you know, all the infection stuff can get out. Cool it down and drink it. Like, that's how they grew up. Like, if you wanted to wash clothes, same stream, get your bucket, go to the stream, wash your clothes. You want to take a bath, stream. Like, that's how they grew up. And then my grandmother decided to, you know what, I'm going to commit my family to the Lord. So my mom and my dad, right, got married. That's my dad's mom. So they got married, came to America, started kind of living their dream. And the reason this hit home for me, because I'm thinking about her legacy, right, my parents' legacy, but also like my legacy. You know, I live in Chicago, and I've kind of been battling, man, I, I want to go back home to Texas. Parents are in Dallas. I want to go back home, but I don't want to live my own kind of thing. I don't, anyone's been there, like, I want to do my own thing and pave my own way. And I was having a conversation last week with, with my dad about coming back home. And he said something to me. He said, son, everything I have is yours. And I understand that you want to kind of do your own thing and go to your own church. My dad's a pastor, has a church. You want to go to your own church, do your own thing. But like, what's mine is yours, but do you believe it? I think a lot of us don't believe, like when God says, hey, son, daughter, what, what I have is yours. I don't know if we believe him when he says that. You know, the more you spend time in scripture, the more you start to realize that some of the stuff we hear from the world isn't all the way true. But some of the stuff we hear from the word, it fills us up, fills us up. 
So I'm reading these words like, man, God loves me. He wants me. He's for me. He inclines his ear to me. Like he, 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 I will call upon him as long as I live. Oh, this is true. Like God actually like listens to me. God not only loves me, but he likes me. How come I haven't spent more time with this? So recently you talk about family and legacy, right? You're five, right? I I mentioned I'm married and got four kids. I'm trying to spend more time with them. What I've been doing recently is uh, our six month old, as I, as I put him to sleep, I'll be speaking these scriptures over him. Like that's why I know this, this verse, right? Because as I'm putting him to sleep, I'm saying, man, I love the Lord because he hears my voice, my supplication. I travel for ESPN for work, right? So like a lot of y'all are, maybe some of y'all are probably sad that there's no games today. I'm happy because I'm not working. There's no games. Um, but I got a chance to be home. To be home. And we live in a society where it's like, man, go and achieve and work and get out. And it's like, no, nah, dude, be home. My, my, my four-year-old, he's like, Daddy, we're doing it last night before I came here. Like, Daddy, we're doing a party. Come on, we're doing a party. And like, they got like some apples and some ham. It was like a weird, like, you know, my daughter had her frozen mic- microphone singing frozen. Like, that was our thing. I do know the words. We're not going to sing it right now. <laughs> but I had been missing on the most important thing that God had given me, not only family, but inheritance, children, wife, kids, because I've been chasing everything else. I've been missing on like my, my, my like immediate family, mom, dad, like, man, we're here for you. We love you. Cause I've been kind of like chasing everything else. Last night I was on the flight, I was writing and like, God was telling me, man, family is a gift that keeps on giving. Like as I'm getting older, right? I'm getting older and I have kids. I'm trying to be better. Dad. I'm looking at my parents. They've been married for almost 40 years. I'm asking them, man, how do I do this well? Talk about keep on giving, right? We have a, we have a, I told you eight year old, six, four, but we have a six month old, right? A baby a gift that keeps on giving. And I'm sitting there saying, man, what am I doing and how have I been using my time? We, uh, I mentioned, or maybe y'all, some of y'all may have been here last time around when I came, it was right after COVID and we, funny enough, I I didn't, I I told a lot of people this, I told the first service, but I'm gonna tell y'all, second people to know, right when COVID happened, I actually was living in Chicago and I left. I left and actually came out here to Arizona. Probably because y'all's restrictions were way lower, but like, hey, neither here nor there. Uh, I wanted to train and get ready for the next season. So I came to Arizona, you're laughing, I really did. Like I came to Arizona and I was training, doing my thing and I was here for a couple months and I felt like God was calling me to go back. And I didn't really know why. Well, that was right around the time where sports had been canceled, right, society separated, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery killed. And I'm sitting there like, dude, what am I, how do I even process this? I hadn't, I hadn't. And God said, it's time to go. So I took this four day road trip back to Chicago. And on the last stop, I was stopped in St. Louis at a hotel. And mind you, we're on the road for like eight hours a day. So I'm not even watching the news. I'm not doing anything. And I turned the TV on. And on the screen, whatever, CNN, Fox, whatever, all you see is, rioting, looting, chaos, and the bottom ticker was in Chicago. Like my home, my people, my family, and I ran away. As I'm coming back, my friend calls, he says, hey Sam, you have to do something. I'm like, what do you mean me? I'm a football player. I'm not an activist. I'm not a, what, like, I don't, what, do you, what, do you, what do you want me to do? He said, Sam, use what you have. And I'm thinking, okay, the things that I, that I have that I'm good at, like I love people. I love relationships, building them. He said, Sam, use it. And so what me and some friends did, I called some friends and brought together athletes from football, baseball, basketball, soccer, um, you know, all the different sports. And we came together to the west side of Chicago where you saw all the stuff, the looting and the rioting. And we said, what if we actually like sat and listened to what was going on and saw up close and personal? We invited some kids from the community, invited some police officers as well. Some of y'all are going to see where I'm going with this. Um, and we just listened. We heard 14 and 15 year old kids, black kids, saying, hey, how come it seems like like when I watch the TV, it's only people who look like me that are getting shot?
weird officers in these circles. We sat in circles. Because I was ready to like, I was going to protest. I was going, whatever you need, I'll do. And one of the nonprofit leaders said, just, just come, just sit with us. Some officers said, you know, our job is to protect and serve. And sometimes we forget the serve part. We sat with some pro athletes, millionaires, guys who had made it. And they're saying, man, I feel this too. So what do we do? Well, we decided to use our time and take a tour of the west side of Chicago. And what I saw there was not too dissimilar to what I'd experienced in Nigeria. Saw communities that had nothing. Seeing like people had turned their backs on, on them. Yes, I saw broken glass and buildings boarded up, but there was something deeper. As, I was, as I'm on this bus, I was sitting there with some of the athletes and one of the young girls from the community, and, and I see Jason Hayward. He played, like I said, mentioned, played for the Cubs, won a World Series, now he plays with the Dodgers. And he's looking out the window, and I'm like, hey, Jason, because I think we saw the same thing. I said, hey, how many... Um, how many liquor stores have you seen on our, I don't know, 15-minute drive so far? He said, I don't know, over 10. I said, okay, how many grocery stores have you seen? He said, maybe one. So we said, that's, that's a problem. What if we could provide a solution? So we're driving and we're sitting and we're thinking on this bus and we're kind of getting back to, you know, finishing our tour and getting to, to get off this bus. And there was a young girl on the bus who's from that community. Her name is Azaria. And, and she's 14, 15 years old at the time. And she says, you know, they asked her to, hey, can you say something just to, for us to understand a little better? And Azaria says, hey, I know some of y'all see this as a field trip to come and visit our community and see what it looks like. But some of us choose to live here we choose to call this place home. So I hope that you'll remember that when you go back to your homes. And so we did. We took some time. We athletes got together, raised some money, and got a chance to build a food mart on the west side of Chicago in this food desert, right? Half mile radius, two grocery stores, 17 liquor stores. We did something. And the cool, coolest part about last week, the event I was at with the mayor and all these people was like, that was an extension of what we were able to do from a few years ago. Long and short of it is like Jason Hayward got together and built this baseball academy. The mayor put some money behind it. All these people built this great facility because they wanted to have some kind of legacy. They wanted to use their time for something bigger than them. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications, because he inclines his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. We love convenience. And I feel like we've started to believe the lie that if we could just get everything the way we want it, we'll be good and safe and life and family and house and all these things. And God says, no, cry out to me. I will answer you. Cry out to me on behalf of your children who are going crazy and running. I will answer you. Cry out to me on behalf of your marriage, which nobody knows, but it's, it's at a breaking point. I will answer you. Cry out to me on behalf of your community, and I will answer you. As we were there last week with these, like I said, dignitaries and athletes, one of the officers who was with us a few years back at the other event happened to be there as well. And um, I'd mentioned you know, like processing seeing George Floyd and all these things, and like, he came up to me, mind you, there's a, you know, obviously some of us have watched this video with Tyree Nichols and Process and Havoc and all these things, and like, I haven't watched that yet. And this cop came up to me and he said, Sam, like, our world is changing. 
Like, there's so much chaos going on. I'm watching, he's telling me, I'm watching this video and I'm looking at these, my colleagues, and I'm like, guys, like time. You, like, you had him apprehend, what are you doing? Just wait. Time. What are you doing with your time? How are you using your time? And I feel like me, I'm like, okay, God, I want to live for you and follow you and serve you. But it's like, what am I doing with my time? What, what is keeping me from doing the things God has for me? Is it fear? Is it doubt? Is it anxiety? Like, what is keeping me from living out? What is keeping you? What is keeping us from living out the God-given purposes that God has put in our hearts and our minds, right? My book, like, let the uh, change starts with you following your fire to heal a broken world. What fire has God put in your heart? And why aren't you stepping and moving towards it? For me, that, that fear is uh, people pleasing. I want everybody to like me. And if you peel back the layers, it's like, okay, well, why? Because then I'll be, I want to be loved. Why do you want to be loved? Because then I'll, I won't be alone. Well, if, if so, then what? If you're alone, then what? Then I'll be like abandoned. It's like my fear is I don't, I don't want to be abandoned, so I'm willing to like acquiesce to everyone else as opposed to obey God. And God says, hey, even after all of like the if so, then what, then what, then what, I'm still with you. Do you believe me? Are you willing to face your fears, your, the things that make you uncomfortable? Are you, feeling like to, are you willing to walk into this discomfort and know that I'm with you? Or will you continue to, to either doubt or sit on the sideline. God wants us to get in the game. God wants us to show up, like, and not just like, oh, in the world, we're gonna change the world, in our marriages, as fathers. Like, there are so many present dads, but are really absent in their heart. And God says, address it. As moms, there's so many moms that like wanna do so much, but it's like, oh, I don't know. God says, I'm, I'm for you. Like my inheritance, my dad told me everything you, I have is yours. God's like, everything I have is yours. In this earth and the one to come, peace, patience, righteousness, all of it. But have you cried out to me? Or do you just want to sit in your comfort and let the world pass you by? I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications, because he inclines his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. If you think about some of these words, it says the cords of death encompassed me. Any of us been there before? All hope was lost. The terrors of shale came upon me, like our biggest fears. The Bible says, like, I looked, I, looked, I found distress and sorrow. And so often we, we like go through life and we, we seek and we find distress and sorrow and, and, and terror and shale, but then we stop. And the Bible's like, no, like this psalmist says, after all that happened, then I called upon the name of the Lord. Like I got down on my knees. I begged, I prayed, I asked. I said, God, oh Lord, I beseech you, save my life. When was the last time you asked for God for something like that? Then it goes on to say the truth of the Lord. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. He preserves the simple. We live in a society where it's like, all right, I'm going to get all my social media and my likes, and I'm going to do this business deal and go around. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and you saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. It goes on to say, for he has saved my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living.
I believe when I said, I'm greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I don't think we thought about God's benefits. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I get stuck. Talk about marriages and kids and music. I get stuck because I forget about God's benefits. And sometimes... I have to sit back and think of the things that God has done. I'm going to share a story um, about a time in Nigeria. Probably was 15 years old at the time, so 15, 20 years ago. And um, God did a miracle. There's a woman who was blind. I know she was blind because I was like kind of one of the people trying to help her up the steps to our, you know, we do this medical mission work and my parents are this nonprofit. We do all this stuff in Nigeria and she couldn't see. She was with her son and she's kind of tripping and stumbling up the steps. And she walks up and we bring like doctors and nurses and dentists and ophthalmologists and pharmacists, and pediatricians, all the things. She comes up to us and she's like, hey, in Igbo, but she's saying, hey, um, I'm blind, but I need some help. Like y'all got glasses, y'all got, it's like, hey, um, we can't help you, right? Like, you're blind. We can give out glasses, but you're blind. We can, um, like, we remove cataracts from people, but you're blind. And she's like, can you help me? Can you help me? We're like, we can't, we can't. And then finally one lady showed up who was from, with, from our, our medical mission team, and she was an anesthesiologist. She said, hey, do you believe in God? The lady says, well, yes, I do, I do. Do you believe that God can do miracles? She says, yes, I do, I do. She said, okay, we're going to have you pray as the band comes up. He said, we're going to have you pray. So we're, she starts to pray. And I'm looking like, I'm like 15 years old at the time. And I'm looking around the corner like, what is going on? Like, this is kind of weird. Like, I'm going to have you pray. And this, they start to pray and pray and pray. And all of a sudden, this woman who couldn't see, they say amen. And the woman starts to like blink. And they have this card and, you know, I'm going to, this isn't yellow, but pretend this like, is like a yellow like, sheet of paper, right? Because we give people cards. Hey, you need you know, eye help or you need medical help or surgery. And this woman starts to blink. And um, they ask her, hey, w- what color is this card? And the woman's like, Ye- yellow. Yellow, yellow. And all of a sudden, her and her son start to like dance and sing and rejoice. Because God did something. There was an issue that they gave to God. They exposed themselves to God. And God did something. So when I asked, like, when was the last time that you actually, like, got on your knees and asked God to do something in your life, with your wife, with your husband, with your child, God will do it. Like, my biggest fear, y'all, has been, man, people and pleasing and abandonment. And, oh, what if I do this and my mom and dad don't like me or my wife or my kids? And God's like, face it, address it. Why? Because I'm with you. I made you. I created you. I want you to fly. But you have to trust me and be willing to jump. You know, before we did that medical missions trip, In Nigeria, we go for about two weeks, and every single day, we'll wake up at at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., we'll worship the Lord. And there's this one song that we sang, and it will never escape my mind, because that was a song that we sang the morning before we saw God do something major, like a real-life miracle. We feel like, well, how come those happen there? They can't happen here. I feel like it's because we're not on our knees asking. And so what I'm going to ask us to do, and I'll teach you the lyrics to this song, but we're gonna sing to the Lord. We're gonna sing to the Lord. And that's like like when you read scripture or sing, like think about these words, but think about God, a God who actually like does what he says. 
Not an earthly father that's like, you know, I, I tell my kid one thing and I do something different the next day. But daddy, you said this. And I'm like, oh, my bad, right? A heavenly father who says, everything I have, my daughter is yours. So stop stopping. Like that dream I put in your heart and you stop, like stop stopping, keep going. No, you're not too old. No, you're not too young. There's a fire and a passion that I placed inside of you and I planted inside of you and it's time to go. It's time to face those fears, those people, those doubts, those, 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 those like injuries, those pangs and let me heal you. We talk about miracles. Sometimes a miracle is just showing up and facing that thing that we were afraid of. So we're gonna sing a song about a God who does miracles. I'm gonna ask you all to stand. And I'm gonna ask you to believe the words you're about to learn. Sound good? You're like, I don't know what words I'm about to learn, so I can't give you a full like commitment. But it goes like this, it says, miracle worker, you are a miracle worker. Come and do a miracle, a miracle today. Come and do a miracle, a miracle today. Miracle worker, you are a miracle worker. Come and do a miracle, a miracle today. Come and do a miracle, a miracle today. Your name is Yahweh. Your name is Yahweh. You are a miracle working God. Your name is Yahweh. Simple as that. So we're going to sing that song. As we sing that song, I would ask, I would beseech you that whatever obstacle or mountain or fear or, or, or addiction or like secret hidden sin that is in your life, give it to God. Show it to God. Whatever sickness, whatever pain, whatever diagnosis, the Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. Give it to God. And believe like that lady believed who stumbled up the steps that God can in fact do a miracle. Like I faced my fear. <laughs> went to my family and I was like, guys, like, I don't know if I can do this. Like this whole like, hey, son, this is yours. And I'm like, but what if I want to do my own thing? Will you still love me? Will you still accept me? Will you still be with me? Or will I be abandoned? And as I'm sitting, have this conversation with my loved ones, like the people who birthed me and like, they love me, but they're like, but son, but son, I'm like, but, but what if God has something different? Will you still accept me or will, my, will I be abandoned? And as I'm having this conversation, all that could come to my mind, yes, we'll sing the song, but it's the scripture that had been in my, in my heart and in my mind. I love the Lord. He hears my voice and my supplications. He, incl he inclines his ear to me. Therefore, I'll call upon him as long as I live. The cords of death encompassed me. The terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, I beseech you. I started calling upon the name of the Lord, save my life. Then I found something. I found that he is in fact gracious. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and you helped me return to your rest. Oh, my soul for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. 
What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? So let's sing about a God that works miracles. Can you help me out? Worker, you are the miracle worker. Come and do a miracle, a miracle today in your marriage. Come and do a miracle, a miracle today. Miracle worker, you are a miracle worker in your job. Come and do a miracle, a miracle today. Come and do a miracle, a miracle today. Your name is Yahweh. Your name is Yahweh. You are a miracle working God. Your name is Yahweh. Your name is Yahweh. Your name is Yahweh. You are a miracle working God. Your name is Yahweh. Miracle worker. You are a miracle worker. Come and do a miracle. A miracle. Our God is a miracle working God. And he's asking us to believe that not only that he is our father, but that we are his children. He wants us to believe that there is an inheritance for us, not just for heaven, but on this earth. He wants us to get off the sideline and get in the game and be a part of him changing this world. He wants us to believe that he can change our, our, he can heal our broken marriages. He can restore our, our, our relationships with our children. He wants us to believe that he can heal our own pain and insecurity and our own addictions and our fears. But he wants us to ask him, to beseech him, to beg him, save my life. Like, I love the ending of that passage. It's like, okay, all these things, God, help, 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 where are you? But it says, man, finally you realize, oh, wow, like, God did it. So what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I shall lift up a cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. Oh, may it be in the presence of all his people. A lot of us have lost loved ones. Talk about carrying those caskets, right? My grandma, Right before this, this service, I was on the phone with one of my mentors who her husband just died from cancer. Like we, we think about these losses and this pain and even COVID losing loved ones. But then you look at scripture, it goes on to say right after that verse, right? What shall I render? It says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. So those loved ones that you lost, they are precious in God's sight. And the world might be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, I called this lady today, like, wanting to, like, mourn with her. Like, my, she was my, my academic advisor from college, my mentor. The reason I got a chance to win all these awards and go to the NFL, I'm calling her thinking I'm about, I'm about to mourn. And she's like, man, like, he's in heaven right now. Like, he's good. Like, I'm sad, but, like, he, he's good. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Oh, Lord, surely I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your handmaid. You have loosed my bonds. What has you in bondage right now? 
Who has you in bondage right now? Will you fear God or fear them? You have loosed my bonds. To you, I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. Oh, may it be in the presence of what? Of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house. In the midst of you, oh, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. See this song, this psalm that we just read? This was the song that the Israelites sang once they, once they escaped captivity. This is, these are the words they said once they were freed from whatever was keeping them captive. And God is like asking you, God is asking you, like just come here, like come here. Let me loose your bonds. You have this anger in your heart towards your children because you didn't have a dad or your dad wasn't present. Let me loose that bond. Man, you have this secret that you kept from your loved one, your spouse. Let me loose that bond. I'm bigger than that. You trust me in these areas, you don't trust me in this one. Right, you accept me here, but you reject me everywhere else. Let me do it. Let me heal you. Let God bless you. And we forget that word. Oh, somebody sneezes, right? Bless you. No, God bless you. God bless you. God keep you. May his face shine upon you. God, the creator of the universe, right? Later on in a different psalm, it says the heavens, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord. But the earth he has given to the sons of men. That's you and you and you. Like sons and daughters, right? That's me. God has given us this earth and we decide to stay in bondage. And he's like, enough. I want you to help free this world, to help change this world. I don't care how young you are, how old you are. I don't care what you look like. You, you will make this world free. And it may be through building uh, uh, food marts in, in food deserts, maybe through starting colleges, starting churches, leaving church. It, you will make this world free if you will allow me to see you, to do open heart surgery on you, and you will worship me in the midst of it. I'm teaching my eight-year-old son, when something bad happens, just say, thank God, right? Oh, it's the worst day, stub my, thank God. Because if you could thank God in the bad, you'll start to remember the good. Oh, wow. I did believe when I said I'm greatly afflicted. I did say in my alarm, all men are liars. But I got to return to my rest, oh my soul, because the Lord has actually dealt bountifully with me. And you too. So we're going to sing that song one more time. I'm going to get off this stage. And we're going to go home. And we're going to think about not only the good that God has done, but also those areas that we need him to show up in our lives because he's bigger than that sin. And he's bigger than your doubt. And he's bigger than whatever anyone said about you. I've heard some things about me. And I'm learning that my God is bigger. That one area that I used to keep from him, I just gave it to him. And God's like, thank you. We're about to fly together. I once was blind, you are not trapped and you don't have to be the, 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 like what mom and dad did, that's not you anymore. Like you're creating a new legacy for you and your wife and your children and their children. So mom and dad, like that was their thing. God has given you a new thing. And this is not just a one-time thing. This is a forever thing. So you can return to your rest. You can return to who, how, who God made you to be. Not what everybody else thinks you should be. Because like 
Yes, the heavens are his, but the earth he gave to you. So the dream in your heart and in your wife's heart, follow it. And you know what God will do? God will honor that. Kings and queens. You are his king. royalty, legacy, and it has nothing to do with you. Understand? Miracle worker, you are a miracle worker. Come and do a miracle, a miracle today. Miracle worker, miracle, miracle. My bad, I messed that up, but y'all know it. Come do a miracle, a miracle today. A miracle, a miracle today. His name is Yahweh. His name is Yahweh. we pray. God, we thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your love, your grace, your faithfulness, God. Thank you for this psalm that was saying, that was read after the Israelites came out of captivity, God. We are saying this in faith, knowing that you are, you have loosed our bonds. You have taken us out of captivity. God, we will no longer go back to who we used to be, God. We will choose to trust you. We will fear you. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Go read Job 28. Go read all the Proverbs. <laughs> the fear of the Lord. Will I fear God or will I fear man? I choose today. I choose today. I choose today to fear God. Choose this day whom you will serve. In the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house. In the midst of you, O oh Jerusalem, O oh Grove Church, O oh God's people, praise the Lord. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. But as for us, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forever. God bless you. Amen.